Welcome to the Action Network podcast presented by FanDuel. We're back with our Experts Guide to Betting Summer Series, and this is the Soccer Edition. I'm your host, Maria Marino, joined by Action Network European football betting experts, Michael Leboff and Anthony DeBundo, also co-hosts of Action Soccer Betting Podcast, Wonder Goal. Guys, how you doing? Pretty pretty pumped, excited uh, to talk some soccer. the The soccer off season is is very short, so Anthony and I are trying to get away from it as much as we can. But uh, now is about the time when uh, things start to to percolate, and I start to miss it. So this is good timing. Yeah, if you're a true crazy, there actually is no off season because MLS is going right now in the summer. But uh, for me personally, and I know Leboff, uh, we don't really mess with MLS too much, so it is nice to get a couple months and kind of reset and keep track of the wild world of transfers, which is what we're doing now. Well, we're going to obviously get into best practices for betting the sport, but since you brought up the calendar, um, for someone who is a complete newbie like myself, can you just give Anthony like a rough breakdown of scheduling and the, the leagues that you like to bet? Yeah, so the big five European leagues uh, run from generally August through the end of May. Uh, So it is a long marathon season. They play 34 to 38 matches in their leagues. And then simultaneously, those matches mostly happen on the weekends. Simultaneously, the top teams in each league will compete in European competitions against other countries. So the top English teams, German teams, Italian, French, Spanish, Dutch, you know, all the other teams will compete against each other during the week in European competitions. That's the Champions League, the most famous Uh, And those matches will happen in the fall is the group stage. And then as we get into the spring and into June uh, is the knockout stage. And that typically ends right around the first weekend of June, maybe the week after Memorial Day. So the season goes very long. And then the summers are typically international play. So the players, many of them will have off. Some of them will have friendlies, qualifying. You'll occasionally get a World Cup or a European championship. Or right now the U.S. men's national team is competing in the Gold Cup but a lot of their top players aren't in it uh, because they're taking the summer off. So it really depends, but summer tends to be international focused, whereas Mm -hmm. the the rest of the year is focused on the club teams that we bet week in and week out. Okay. So basically you will never be bored uh, betting soccer. Why don't we get into sort of the qualifications for both of you and what makes you each a betting expert? Michael Leboff, we'll start with you and sort of the experience that has led you to where you are now. Yeah, I've been betting soccer for a decade plus. I can't really put a, a number on it, but basically half my life at this point. And um, what what I found is is working with with people like Anthony and BJ, who are uh, who build models, betting models, and 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 use a lot of uh, predictive analytics to to come up with their bet. I I take a lot of what they're doing, and and then I try to exploit the uh, inefficiencies in the market. I think that bookmakers more in soccer, more than any other sport under underestimate the extremes, uh, which is for me, leads me to betting a lot of bad underdogs in in premier league and uh, other leagues. Um, But I don't think that the, the gap between these teams is, is, um, is as wide as, as the odds will, will, will suggest for the most part. So that is kind of where I start from. And I've, I've found a lot of success as that using that as my foundation taking what I think uh, from, from just, you know, pencil and paper handicapping and then talking with BJ and Anthony and, and folks who, who, who build models and, and make sure I'm not way off uh, and go from there. So it's, it's um that's a, a quick look into, into my process and, and why I've had success, I guess, for, for uh, quite some time now betting footy. Yeah. It's well, funny. If you, can- if you pull up Leboff's action profile in the premier league. He probably wins like 30% of his bets, but because he's betting four to one, five to one, six to one, eight to one, you end up making a, quite a bit of money uh, and quite a good ROI just because, you know, he has an eye for kind of finding the big underdog that maybe BJ and I are too in the weeds to, uh, to pick up on. And that's kind of what makes our podcast fun is that, you know, we have different approaches and and kind of how we go about finding who we're going to bet. Uh, and it makes for a good discussion usually. I was just going to mention, in case you don't know, BJ is uh, referring to BJ Cunningham, who also uh, works on our Action Network podcast, Wonder Goal. But Anthony, please continue about just sort of how you've gotten into the sport of soccer and then betting it. 
Yeah. So the first year I remember betting was uh, 2015, 2016. I lost a bunch of money fading Leicester City. Uh, and then Euro 2016, uh, when they won the Premier League, I famously picked them to finish last and they won the league. So uh, not great on my part. So it was a rough beginning. But uh, yeah, Euro 2016, uh, also a heartbreaker, had a big ticket on France to win, win it all. And, and they lost in the final. So uh, it was a tough start, but I've really gotten into kind of the week to week actions of the Prem. Uh, and then I think I would say maybe 2019 heading into COVID and then coming out of COVID is when I really kind of try to expand into more than just the Premier League. Because the Premier League is is essentially the NFL in the sense that it's like a pretty hard market to beat. Uh, and there are a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs and a lot of people betting into that market. Whereas I think the other leagues, it's similar in that sense, but not at the same level. So, you know, in Germany, in Spain, Italy, France, and if you go down the ladder, uh, the, the opportunities are there too uh, to try to exploit it. So I've been betting, you know, the main... Premier League, probably eight years now, seven years. Uh, whereas with uh, the other leagues, probably three to four years. And then Euro 2016, World Cup 2018, uh, the, the major European international events and, and worldwide international events have, have been really fun uh, to get into. You know, Copa America a couple of summers ago as well. So I've been betting, you know, soccer for almost eight years now. Well, Anthony, you spoke of rough beginnings, um, but. Uh, Mike, can you talk to us about how you go from being a beginner uh, betting soccer to actually being successful betting it? And, and what does that take? Yeah, the first first thing um, that you'll you'll notice when you're starting to kind of come into your own as a better soccer is the, the market movement. You can get ahead of the market movement lines uh, open. It's it's like football where it's a week a weekly sport for the most part. So you have lines for for days and days in advance. Um, and if you're ahead of the market, uh, and and you see that lines are moving generally in the direction that you're betting, that's when you can start to tell that okay, I'm I'm onto something here. Even if I'm losing bets and maybe not making uh you know a positive ROI, if you're if you're getting closing line value, I think in in soccer, uh, that's that's signal number one. Uh, and number two is just kind of figuring out uh, have generating profiles for teams. I think Anthony and I, you'll hear on our podcast all the time that we'll, we'll circle teams that we know punch up well as underdogs. We'll circle teams that we know don't do as well as favorites and they can be the same team. Maybe this team is great as an underdog and doesn't do well as a favorite based on their, their profile as a team, how they like to play. Uh, and if you start to notice that those profiles are matching up with, with real life, with those results, uh, you're, you're onto something and, and you're already ahead of the game. Um, and, and a lot of that is just watching, getting used to the rhythms of a season uh, and also understanding the the betting market in soccer, which as Anthony said, it's kind of like the NFL. I think you're, you're going to have teams that are always going to take public money and they're always going to be a little overvalued because of their, their name brand uh, and, and their star power. And then you're going to have smaller teams, uh, you know, the, the minnows of, of the betting world that, that aren't. And, when you can kind of mesh all that together, uh, you, you'll have a like a guess like a moment of clarity. It's not a tangible thing to say, but um, and you'll start to to really figure out or or to to notice that you're starting to figure it out. So uh, those are the signals I look for. It's just like beating the market and noticing these trends that are are agreeing with actual results. Yeah, I would Anthony. say eliminating bias part of it for me. Like I bet against Tottenham. I'm a Tottenham fan. I'm open about that. We joke about it on the pod a lot. I'm, I bet against Tottenham probably more than any other team in the league last year. I uh, just didn't think the market was right on them. And then eventually, uh, you know, the market did catch up and kind of realized that they were just a mid table team, but uh, they, you know, being able to eliminate your fandom and your bias is a, is a first step, I think, in trying to uh, become better at this understanding the stats that matter. You know, we use expected goals and expected threat and ball progression and, shot stopping uh, a lot on our show. And I think a lot of it comes down to soccer is such a slow event sport. There's, there's not a lot of actions like in basketball, there's rebounds, points, assists, three points, even though it's a fluid game, there's so many different stats that are widely known, widely used to kind of evaluate players and teams uh, in baseball. Of course, everything is an outcome. And even in football to a lesser extent, it's harder for some positions, but in football, you can kind of have a, a an opinion on how much the quarterback matters, but in soccer, like there's just not as many widespread publicly used and discussed stats. Everything's kind of vibes a lot. Uh, and you can, I think exploit the market because of that. So, uh, it's, it's tricky, but 
you mm-hmm. kind of want to dig in and kind of learn, you know, what goes into creating a goal, progressing the ball up the pitch, having possession in dangerous areas, using that to create shots from good chances, not just, you know, oh, we had 20 shots, but none of them were high quality. So we never were going to score those kind of statistics kind of looking beyond just your basic box score of, oh, this team had 61% possession. Well, what does that mean? Where do they have the ball? Uh, what did they do with the possessions when they lost it? Where did they lose it? How dangerous were they about to concede? So uh, all those little kind of the fluidity of soccer makes it fun and, and more challenging. Well, you bring up a number of stats that are important to know, and I want to get into uh, more of those resources and where you can find some of that information in just a bit. But Anthony, since you brought up sort of comparing to other sports, Mike, I wanted to get your opinion on whether you think there is a parallel between betting soccer and betting hockey, since you are also a hockey betting expert. Is that something that like people who have nothing know nothing about the sports say is that just a cliche saying or do you think there is a parallel um as you also host our action network podcast line change yeah there definitely is a parallel and and i don't think um i'd be the only one to say that uh hockey and soccer are sports with two teams trying to put uh an object into a goal past the goalie so right away there's that natural uh relation Uh, and then as you know, hockey, it's it's more high event than soccer, but it's still, when you look at the scoreboard at the end of a hockey game, it's pretty low event compared to basketball or baseball because of all the different things that go into every pitch, you know, what and, and at bat, et cetera. And, and like soccer, hockey has, uh, you know, a shot. Where did that shot come from? What was it? Was it true value as a shot? Like, was it just a shot from the point that was like a wrist shot that had no traffic in front of the net. Does it, does it really have a chance of going in in soccer similarly? So we rely on the same stat uh, in, in soccer and hockey, which is um, basically where we build our entire handicap from uh, or start it, I should say is uh, expected goals, which takes the value of, of a shot on goal, whether it's uh, hockey or soccer, where did it come from? What kind of shot was it? Did it come after a series of passes, et cetera? Uh, and, and all those things kind of go into this one metric and you can get a better idea of, you know, what, what team actually tilted the field or the ice. And uh, you use those stats very similarly in, in hockey and soccer. So although when you're watching the two sports, they, they might not feel the same, look the same. They're not even right. played on the same type of ground. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they are in terms of a handicapping uh, pretty similar. You're you're looking for the same kind of signals, the same kind of trends, and and making very similar bets, right? Money line bets. Well, you you talked about building a handicap. So, Anthony, as we sort of establish a foundation for betting this sport, are there any other you know pillars that we should know going in? I find recent form to be overrated. Uh, any team can run hot for a couple of games. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll see if you, you hear, if you just turn on a, a match and they're talking about it and they'll say, well, you know, Aston Villa's been in great form. They've won their last three matches. And then you look at the box score and it's like, well, yeah, they won one nil in all three of these games, but they've kind of played poorly and got a couple bounces and scored off a corner and a penalty and didn't really deserve to win those games, but they've won their last three matches. So they've got to be in good form. Uh, and so, you, you know, you'll find that results kind of bias us uh, and, and it can bias the market too. If a team runs really hot where, uh, you know, they're, they're scoring every shot for a little while. Uh, those kind of streaks don't tend to continue. Some things are predictive in soccer and some things are noise and kind of being able to separate what is predictive and what is noise uh, is really important. So if a team all of a sudden is creating tons and tons of chances because they tweaked their system or they started playing this other player, this other striker, whereas this other team, yeah, they're getting like three shots a game, but this one striker had three goals that were just incredible finishes that he's probably not going to be able to continue to do. Well, what's signal, what's noise. The signal is the underlying stuff that you see in the data. So I think that's one of the big pillars is kind of just like recently or uh, not throwing out form because it doesn't matter, but not overrating like how Mm -hmm. a team has played in their last three to five matches is not as important because priors exist. We have, you know, a team like a, a Liverpool this season is a good example. They came into the season after last year, they were second in the league, second best team in the world. They had a really poor start to the season. Now you can say, well, Liverpool, their XG difference is about even this year. They're an average team now, but just last year they were a juggernaut. So which the true team, I don't think you can just throw out 
the priors just because they had a poor run with most of the same players. Uh, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. So you always want to kind of regress a team back toward what their prior level is, because generally speaking, unless there's a huge change in talent or manager, uh, teams don't just become bad overnight. Right. Teams don't just become elite overnight. They they tend to have progression uh, and it's a slow build or a slow burn uh, to get to those points. So, you know, you should always, any kind of you're getting new information, you kind of want to regress it to what we've seen about this team in the past. And it sounds like in the short term, the score is just not always indicative of the level of play and the opportunities that that teams are getting. So, uh, Mike, what else would you say is uniquely challenging about betting soccer? Yeah, the maybe the most frustrating thing about betting soccer is being on top of lineup news um, and player movement. We're dealing with... Uh, a very different kind of media in overseas where it's very tabloidy uh, to put it mildly more than here where it's, it's more buttoned up. And if Kirk cousins is, is hurt um, that will be reported out. There will yeah. be, you know, news on it. He'll be definitively kind of ruled in or out for the most part um, or like trending one direction in soccer. It is not even as close to as black and white as it is in, in sports that are uh, more popular here. It's, it's bizarre is the only way I can put it. Um, and then you have the the morning of you don't get lineups until an hour before a match as well. So like, it's not that you're flying blind, but compared to basically every other sport uh, that, that is popular amongst betters, you're flying as blind as, as possible. And then the, like the in and outs of the schedule, you have to deal with players going on international breaks. For example, if if you're I'm, I'm an Everton fan, they had a, a very important Colombian defender, Yeri Mina, uh, for the past six, seven years. He's gone now, but he'd go to Colombia for international uh, play during the two week breaks that are built into a regular season. He would get hurt, but you'd have no idea. You'd have no idea how serious the injury was, what because you're not only dealing with now a European media contingent, but you're dealing with a South American media contingent. And then all you want is the answer is, okay, is this guy playing or not? And you're not going to find out a lot of times until an hour before a match. Coaches will rule players out here and there, but it's not always the case. So trying to get information is definitely the hardest part. Secondly, it's the schedule uh, Mm -hmm. and just working in fatigue because not every player's schedule is going to be the same. They could play next to each other on the same exact team in the English Premier League, but one could play for... Uh, you know, Belgium and could be playing a very busy international schedule. The other could play for, you know, Burkina Faso in Africa and his schedule could be completely different in the break. So there's all this stuff that kind of gets worked in um, and it it does present some, some serious challenges. Yeah. I, that That is the number one thing, the lineups, right? So if you want to bet soccer and you want to like, your goal is like, I really want to beat the market. I want to get my CLV. Uh, you either got to bet the openers or you have to try to anticipate line moves because the the openers are, are softer generally, right? You can bet the market on the opener, then the market will move. And then if you can kind of get ahead of the injury news, but if, unless you are sitting on a press conference where a manager says, you know, Mo Salah is out this weekend, one of the most important players in the league, Erling Holland is only going to play a half. And you can sit on that news and bet on that. Good for you. If not, you'll see the market in soccer will move an hour before the match more than any other sport, just because of the lineups. And it's really hard to, con- like you know, to, say how much is Yerry Mina you know Michael mentioned what is he worth to the spread because we don't have stats for defenders at the same level we know that if Nikola Jokic is out for the Nuggets the line's going to move what six points five points we know that if Tom Brady isn't playing for Tampa I know he's retired now the line's (laughs) going to move four points if if Mahomes is out it's going to move six points but like what is it worth if Mo Salah sits and a slightly worse player comes in it's hard to really quantify it in soccer to the same level so and that's one of the biggest challenges for sure. And, and uh, always hard. And, and then just the variance of it all, you know, like being able to t- just swallow the the pill of uh, the fact that there's only three or four goals. If you're lucky in a game, sometimes there's none. A lot to keep up with. I would uh, suggest that probably a, a one way to defend against some of these challenges is to follow folks like you, 
um, who are putting in the time, who are putting in the research and crunching these numbers and tracking bets on the action app. So I would encourage anyone to, to follow the likes of you all and uh, to find uh, you know the right people on Twitter and the right list to, to follow to make sure you stay um, in tuned with some of these things. And I do have one follow-up because as you both have laid out, it is challenging. So I guess my question is, Anthony, what do you like about betting soccer? And not much. No. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, we have our own unique time window, which I think is really cool. And I love that about the sport. I love being able to wake up on a Saturday morning at 730 and have, um, you know, something that I am very into and, and, and can kind of build out and kind of uh, make it our own. We have our own little community on Twitter. We have our own little community of people who are into soccer and the rest of the of the American sports media thinks we're kind of crazy and kooky and weird. And <laughs> but we have a lot of fun with it. And and if really you ingrain yourself in the culture of it all and kind of the history and the storylines and the and just the moments and the passion, like it is extremely special. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it is just a one match in a 38 match season, but truly it is anything can happen in, in this league. You know, you see teams that uh, have no business losing, get upset all the time by inferior opponents just because of the variance of it. You know, one bounce or one deflection can change a whole game. So uh, I love it. Uh, it's a fun challenge. It's yeah. a it's a market that I think is largely untapped in America and is going to only continue to grow as, you know, becomes more and more popular. America's sport of the future since 1972 is the running joke. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of fun, like I said, and yeah. it's a challenge but it's, it's different from what a lot of people talk about. And, you know, everybody wants to talk about the NFL at all hours of the day, all weeks of the year, uh, but there are other sports and they're a lot of fun to, uh, to dive into. That's tender. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like the, I, Anthony was kind of complaining about variance, but I, I love that the variance in soccer, just like in hockey has such a heavy impact on the final result that if you're like me and, and betting teams that are regularly eight to one, 12 to one to win a 90 minute match of soccer, you know, week in and week out, you're just, you're rooting for those weird moments. You're rooting for a deflection or a red card or something just to throw the game completely off script. Um, and, and watching that all kind of crescendo into, you know, the last five minutes of a, of a match when you're, you know, on a, on a 15 to one underdog that maybe is up one nil on the, on man city, the best team in the world. And you're just holding on for dear life. It's, uh, those are, uh, those are really special moments in soccer because the amount of crescendos that, that kind of peaks and valleys in a, in a soccer match. And then of course, in, a, in an entire season are, I think kind of every other sport pales in comparison to them. Yeah. Michael, I think that there's like, especially for you, um, just some beauty in the ugliness, uh, yeah. if you will, and just sort of accepting that and embracing it and uh, just having fun with the challenges that could arise and, and the unknowns. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are definitely, there are definitely times like I'll go, I'll go weeks in a season without winning a bet. I think, you know, if you look at, like Anthony said, you pull up my action profile and you go to last season, you'll probably see three or four weeks where I was losing maybe 11, 12 in a row, but then the next two that I hit are, uh, you know, make up for all that. And uh, it's just, you know, riding those waves and figuring out and getting used to it is is really important. And 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 knowing if you can, you know, right, like doing it responsibly and, and knowing that if, you know, is this too much for me to to watch these terrible teams lose week in, week in, week in and week out, um, just because at, at the end of, you know, a seven or eight week stretch, you're going to get, you know, a massive payoff or one right. or two wins. So, uh identifying those things and, and what, what kind of better you are and tolerance you have for risk is, is also pretty important. I think betting is a game of runs and it's about playing uh, the long game, but um, let's get into a couple more um, tools, resources, any data points that you guys think are important to know of that are in your toolkit as a sharp better, Anthony. Yeah, there's kind of the, uh, the three sites that I look at the most, um, footballreference.com, fbref.com. They do an amazing job of just compiling all kinds of data on players and teams and uh, have a, a lot of historical data. Understat is similar in that nature. It's a different model with XG, uh, but they also do passes per defensive action, which is like a me measure of how much you press uh, and how intense your press is. The analyst does really good stuff with set pieces. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of different sites. Uh, Mark Stats on Twitter has some really good stuff on like opposition buildup and goalkeepers um, and kind of expected threat, which I talked about, you know, which is like 
a measure of uh, field tilts, like how much are you pressuring the opponent versus how much are they pressuring you with possession in dangerous areas. And those are kind of the big websites that I use to kind of compile data from and build out and, and look into. And I, I think soccer is a sport that you need to watch more than others. You, you don't need to watch a minute of baseball to be a good baseball better. Uh, I don't think that's the case for soccer, whereas soccer, like you have to at least have an understanding of how a team is playing and be able to understand where things are changing because teams are not static over the course of a nine month season uh, and they'll make changes, whether it's tactical, whether it's personnel, how are they changing how they're playing and how does that impact what they may look like as a team going forward? If a team changes managers, what's the manager style? So uh, all of these things, I think you do need to have an eye for kind of understanding the game a little bit, uh, find smart people who you think understand the game well and have them teach it to you either indirectly, like, you know, consume their content or, or, or reach out and, you know, try to learn from them as well. So uh, I enjoy that part of it as well. Uh, and it's always a learning game. Like I'm, I'm learning new stats every year. I feel like there's always something new coming out in the, in the soccer media where I'm like, Oh, this stat is cool. And then I'm <laughs> learning about it. You mentioned uh manager changes. I know that can happen in season, of course, but um, currently in the summer months, we are technically in the off season. What other changes, Mike, do you feel like you need to be on top of? In the in the off season, yeah, it's you know transfers in and out, and similar to that lineup news cycle, this is it's that on steroids. Trying to figure out transfers, it's there's mm-hmm. so many different sites. Any whether a player follows a team on Instagram or on Twitter or whatever can set off a, a riot in in a, in a European country. Um, so just trying to figure out who's coming in, who's who's coming out is 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 a challenge in itself, but what it can tell you is, especially if there is a new manager um, coming in into a team over the summer, the kind of players he's looking for, where he thinks his his team is uh, is lacking, where the reinforcements are coming, and w- what kind of system do these do these players uh, fit in? You know, you're not going to bring in two big center backs if uh, you want to play, uh, you know, this this big, expansive pro- progressive soccer. Uh, and similarly, if, you know, a team like Everton and their manager, Sean Dyche, like he's, he's got a very specific style that he wants to play. He's not going to bring in, you know, these, these little, um, you know, creative, s- smaller central midfielders. And so just trying to figure that kind of stuff out and, and what it means for a team's profile going forward is important in the summer. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a whole new variable in, in the soccer world. And I guess in the sporting world at large this year, which is uh, the Saudi pro league uh, just coming and poaching players from you. It used to be that, you know, China would just was, was the the threat to kind of take players towards the end of their career or the MLS, you know, more of players that are inching cl- closer to retirement who don't have huge impacts on their teams. But right now, Saudi Arabia, the, the Saudi pro league is picking some, some serious players out of the big five leagues in, in Europe. So now working that in, but hopefully, and, and the other problem with this, if I, if I may add, is that the season starts and the transfer window is still open. So, uh. so there's still a lot of action going on uh, behind the scenes at every team for the first month of the season. Like the team that plays their first three or four games, which is not a small, it, I mean, it's a small sample, but it's still meaningful uh, in terms uh-huh. of 38 game season. Like you're playing with a roster that isn't, your roster for the season. So that is uh, another challenge as well. So th- the summer that's like, as, as I said off the top, like getting away from it is, is pretty important because I just want to at least have a, a more concrete grasp on, on the type of teams we're going to be dealing with uh, week one of the premier league season uh, rather than get too caught up in, in the, the whirlwinds of transfer season, which are fun as a fan, but for better, I try to just almost completely ignore even as a fan, I usually try to ignore it. I just like, oh, one, until it's officially done, I don't want to hear about it because like I, Fair. so many fake reports out there. Um, so many like X player has been linked to Y team and it's usually just the agent trying to like boost their right. profile, right? Um, so there's a lot more of that than you see in the, and you're seeing it more and more in American sports too now, which is kind of interesting. But the, uh, the fact that the window is still open, I think Michael made a good point about that. You'll see teams come out first couple weeks of the season really stink and the manager will be like oh well i thought we had this address but clearly we don't let's go buy somebody for 60 million and mm-hmm. united kind of did it last year they they came out they got destroyed the first couple of games they went and bought real madrid's stop uh, you know ball stopping midfielder for 100 million so 
Uh, and then they became a much better team after that. Uh, so you'll see teams adjust just based on those couple of games. And you have to kind of be willing to not throw out the priors, like I said, but kind of evaluate on the fly and say, well, they lost this match. They played poorly, but they brought in three new players since then. So they're a much better team now. How much better? I don't know. That's a tough one. So it's, it's really hard. Uh, and it, it typically takes 10 matches in a season for you to have like a pretty confident baseline on how good the team is for that year. Until then, there's a lot of noise. Right. And your brain can only absorb so much. So I like the point that you made about kind of not putting too much stock in information until it's actually real and concrete. But on a more uh, micro level, match to match, Mike, can you describe an ideal betting opportunity heading into a soccer match? Yeah, there's there's a couple of uh, parts of the season that I that I really like um, to bet. And that, that goes into the fact that I like to bet these big prices. One is right off the beginning, right in the beginning of the season, uh, because as Anthony said, you, you really don't have an idea of uh, a solid idea of, of what where a team's level truly is. Uh, and you can play into that if you think that uh, a, a team is ascending. We've seen it with in the Premier League with, with clubs like Brentford and Brighton over the past few years. And we've been on onto those early and often. Um, and then the way that the schedule works with international breaks catching teams, maybe looking ahead to a two week break um, against uh, those are, those are, I think are good times to fade big favorites as well, because you can, a lot of those players are, are looking ahead to, okay, I'm going home to, you know, Mexico or, you know, Bolivia, wherever they're going. Um, and those, those are natural times to, to catch teams and letdown spots. Similarly, uh, when the champions league and European schedules pick up, We'll have situations where a team like Liverpool, for example, who's, who's always in the Champions League or Europa League, they're always playing some sort of European competition. Maybe they have uh, a match against Barcelona coming up on a Tuesday. They're playing sa- a Saturday night in you know the northeast of England on like a rainy pitch or something. They could be caught looking ahead. So uh, I, those schedule spots and and working some sort of uh, you know like I said pen- pencil and paper handicapping angles uh, into into those always are fun and. They do uh, end up working out, I think, more often than not, uh, especially if you're betting into into these big, big underdogs. Anything to add on that, Anthony? Uh, like any sports betting market, any market in general, the, the, the principles of like buying low and selling high exist and are certainly a big part of what we do on our show and what we try to, you know, figure out when a team may be peaking, figuring out when a team has already peaked and when a team has already hit the floor, kind of on like, this is the cheapest you're ever going to be able to buy. Liverpool, where this is the most expensive Man City's been all season. It might be time to bet against them. And then you still lose anyway because they're unbeatable last year. Um, you know, so there's no like tried and true, like this is the way type thing. But uh, the, you know, the buy high and or buy low and sell high is certainly one of the principles that I still strongly believe in. Uh, and, and that teams tend to regress toward their expected goals totals over the course of a season. So if a team is running really hot, uh, you know, XG versus goals. So if a team has scored, you know, 15 goals, they're finishing 28% above their XG. It's a very safe bet. There are always exceptions and there's always one or two every year that kind of don't regress in the course of a season, but you'll see teams that will start hot. And then it's like, Oh, this team can't finish. Well, no, that's just kind of how it works. There's th- these things can tend to balance out over the course of a long season and trying to predict kind of where a team may be headed based on that uh, is one thing I like to do as well. All right, we are winding down here on the Experts Guide to Betting Soccer on the Action Network podcast, but a couple more things before we go. Let's touch on the increased popularity of prop betting. How has that impacted the market, Mike? Yeah, I think uh, it, like in any other sport, the and in, in, in the advent of, of legalized betting and in the United States, uh, the derivative markets are are starting to get uh, more more popular. And for me, I I, I love betting anytime goal scores or, or first goal scores uh, in soccer. Uh, it's it's a fun bet. It's it's a type of bet that you should kind of temper your expectations with. It's it's more fun than it is uh, looking for and grinding out like expected value. <laughs> um, but I I look for teams. Uh, one of my favorite angles is to to back center backs on teams that are good on set pieces. Uh, for example, like I, I mentioned, I'm an Everton fan, so so players like like if Michael Keane was playing, 
uh, Gary Mina as well. Like if, if those guys were, were in the lineup last year, I would, I would have them circled uh, because they're looking just to put the ball into the, into the mixer and, and hopefully the bounce goes their way. And those guys are usually there. Um, Anthony uh, can, can tell you he's, he's much more of a robust prop better. He gets into the weeds uh, a little bit more uh, in terms of like shots and, and possession stuff. So I'll flip it over to him, but I, I like to, just just play into those those kind of big big prices on on first goals and and any goal scores. Yeah, for me, like anytime goal scores have become very popular, it's like, oh, I'm betting Erling Holland to score at minus one forty. Like, uh, no, thank you. Um, there's a pretty big hold on those markets, and I don't bet them a ton. Uh, it's a one way market. You can't ever bet a guy to not score. Uh, which I think is telling in a way. So I don't bet a ton of any time goal scores. If I do, it's it's more what Michael does, where it's like, oh, you know, for some tactical tweak or for some reason, uh, you know, this player I think is going to be much further forward or they're going to get a bunch of set piece opportunities. And this is the player that could benefit. So at 18 to one or something, I'm going to throw a couple bucks on, you know, a guy for some fun, something to watch. If I don't really, you know, have another bet, and I want action and and whatnot. And I think that's fine. Uh, I, I like, I just don't get the allure of betting like most solid a score at odds on uh, in a match when he's not, he, sh- he shouldn't really ever be, uh, you know, odds on unless they're playing one of the worst teams in the league. So th- those are the kind of things I don't get into a ton. Uh, but corner props are popular as well. Like how, which team will have more corners. Um, you'll see that a lot. It's just so game state dependent. If a team is minus mm-hmm. 300 and they're going to be like minus two and a half on the corners for the game. So they're the favorite. Let's say they're at home. Whether or not you win the bet is pretty much dependent on whether the cor- the team scores early or late. If the home team goes up early, then the game kind of evens out a little bit. The underdog has to come out and play more. They're more likely to get corners. Uh, and so your bet's in trouble if they score early at the home favorite. If the home favorite is 0-0 in the 70th minute, the underdog is going to start playing for the tie. They're going to be more defensive. And then the home team may rack up the corners. But that's like not it's, – it's hard to handicap – uh, you know, that kind of thing when it's so game state dependent, like if a team is tied or losing late versus if a team is winning, uh, it's a huge thing. So you're betting favorites on corners, but if they score early, you could be in trouble. So I don't bet corner props a ton shots on goal. Um, you'll see this with teams. I'll do this occasionally. If a team is super reliant on getting one or two big chances, but doesn't get consistent shot volume, I'll generally look to play against those teams that don't really hold possession. Uh, and then possession props. I have fun with those. Sometimes you can bet, over under percentage of possession for a team. I'll do that in like some big matches world cup uh, where I think like a team is clearly committed to like a tactical approach uh, that, that will lead to certain outcomes, but not a ton of props for me, just something fun to kind of sprinkle on a game. If it's like a big match and I don't have other action down. I would imagine that you could use some of those stats, Anthony, as well to inform whether or not you want to live bet a soccer match Um how do you approach that and how should a gambler approach it? Yeah. Uh, you'll see me live bet, uh, unders a decent amount in the app, in the app. If you follow me, you know, if I like a pregame under, uh, and a team goes up an early goal, if I lean away, then I'll, I'll, you know, let's say it's two and a half and a team who is a favorite, but is not the most aggressive or expansive team scores early. Uh, I'll look to play a live under just because I think that team, you know, I trust their defense, but I don't think they're going to continue to be expansive. If you see teams, you know, score totally against the run of play, maybe look to live bet against them. Uh, just make sure you're not betting huge in, in holds, like like huge uh, vig there, because you tend to get that a lot too. Uh, and then you know, live uh, comebacks on on underdogs. If you have a team like uh, Leeds United, for example, last season in the in the league, they would often go down, but they were very comfortable playing from behind and would often retake leads and then, and then blow it again. Uh, you can get kind of better live prices on teams that have these volatile back and forth kind of matches. Um, it, I think the biggest thing with live betting is just kind of understanding tactics and, and approach and how a team plays in certain game states. Newcastle last season, once they got ahead, they were so dominant just because of how they played. Their style was really conducive. Uh, if you picked up on that early in the season, you could have made a lot of money betting Newcastle alt spreads once they went up in games. But once you, you know, if you don't pick up on it until the midway point of the season, maybe it's not as effective. So you kind of have to get in a feel for how a certain team is going to play in certain game states. Why don't we end on this? Michael, we'll start with you. What is the ultimate thrill betting a soccer match? I I think the ultimate thrill is finding a, an underdog. You like a big underdog, let's say, you know, five to one or greater, uh, watching them score that that first goal of the game off like a fluke and then just 
white knuckling through through the next you know 86 minutes of of a, of a match or something because soccer matches feel long they they are long especially when they they feel longer when you're betting them and they feel even longer than that uh when you are uh holding a, a big ticket on a on an underdog that has has a lead so not even winning the bet but those kind of 30 minutes in between like if, if if you get an early goal from an underdog a big underdog and there's like 30 minutes between like minute 40 and 70 are, are probably my favorite time uh as a soccer better because not, you feel like you're you're like slowly getting to the finish line and then you look and you're like it's only the 66 minute and i still have to go through another 24 plus stoppage time for this so uh that that feeling of dread i think is, <laughs> is the ultimate thrill of uh in betting soccer once again, embracing the struggle and the dread. I could just feel the sweat, uh, but also excitement. Anthony, what about for you? Um, you know, this is super sad and <laughs> what the soccer has, the soccer world has come to. But uh, I tend to have unders more than overs. And I will say there is no better feeling than when a goal goes in and then like 30 seconds later, VAR, which is the video assistant replay, they they say VAR is having a check, and then they they start drawing the lines on the pitch to see if the guy was offsides by like his toenail or like his oh. his big his big toe, or like his 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 shoulder was a couple centimeters offside, and then they VAR off the goal. Uh, that's the that's the like you know the, in the spirit of the game it sucks because it's you know it's taking away a lot of joy from people, but <laughs> when you have the when you have the under and, and you see the the VAR, the guy does the little rectangle, the ref does yeah. the rectangle with his hands, then he puts his hand up for offside. That is the kind of high that you dream of. Uh, but also just any time that you get a, a swing and stoppage time. I mean, you've already counted the bet out. You're expecting a loss. You know, you're, you're, you're gasping, grasping at straws, trying to get one last chance and they score and it swings a match for you. Uh, it, it's, it's the best feeling. Just living for those replay reviews. So yep. enjoyable. Um, Michael Leboff and Anthony DeBundo, hosts of our Action Network football betting podcast, Wonder Goal. Can each of you just share where we can find you on Twitter and or the award-winning Action app? Yeah, my uh, my Twitter account is uh, the Big Lebowski with two E's. Uh, and on Action, you can find me at uh, Leboff M. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. My name, at Anthony DeBundo, D-A-B-B-U-N-D-O. And then in the app, same name, same username. You can catch me betting, uh, struggling through Wimbledon and baseball right now. And as we get into getting ready for the next soccer season. Well, once again, this has been our expert's guide to betting soccer edition for Michael Leboff and Anthony DeBundo. I'm Maria Marino. Thanks so much for listening and also be on the lookout for our other expert guides to sports betting with episodes being released throughout the summer right here on the Action Network podcast presented by FanDuel.